Okay, so today we'll be talking about Chapter 27, Section 1. It's called Post-War America. We'll be talking about the Truman and Eisenhower administrations. Truman Democrat, Eisenhower Republican, and we'll get to some of those differences and in, in what that meant in the 1950s. Uh, but we'll also talk about how both leaders worked to make the nation, in terms of social, economic, and political adjustments uh, to the country following the Second World War. So I want to start with the GI Bill. Passed in 1944, the purpose of this was to ease veterans' return to civil life. It's huge. It paid, in many cases, full or partial tuition for university, unemployment benefits while veterans transitioned from the military to civilian life, and even loans. Home loans, business loans, um, helped people get on their feet. I mean, you got to think about 15 million men were mobilized to go into this war. Um, millions are returning home. And what are they going to do? You know, one of the problems of the First World War was that these millions of people returning home were either putting others out of work or found themselves unemployed like the Bonus Army. And it, we have the opposite problem in the Second World War. So many veterans are taking advantage of the GI Bill and getting these guaranteed low-cost home loans, guaranteed low-cost business loans, uh, accessing college, many for the first time in their family. There's a housing shortage. How cool is that? People cannot build houses fast enough to keep up with the demand. As a result, you get new mass production methods, many of which were developed during the war, uh, that are being used to build homes quickly. Um, and, and many people move to suburbs. You know, suburbs are small residential communities, like we just moved to Etowah. So Etowah is a small residential community outside of Hendersonville. You know, some people there even commute to Asheville. And it's quiet there. It's peaceful. A car drove by my house last night. That's it. You know, it's, it's quiet. It's peaceful. Um, and, and, and so many people choose to move to those types of places. And they can, uh, thanks to this post-war prosperity. There's also going to be some social adjustment. Um, more women are going into the workforce than ever. You know, of course, we've talked a lot about Rosie the Riveter. And, um, and even, you know, in addition to the civil rights movement, there's going to be a lot of changes in gender roles after the war. Uh, for one, more women um, are emancipating themselves from broken marriages by seeking divorce. And so you're going to see a rise in the divorce rate. And you get various commentaries on that. But just, you know, in general, more people are getting out of bad marriages. And, of course, that does lead to a rise in the divorce rate. But also, um, you're going to see some economic readjustment. You know, the GI Bill is not just a magic wand. The post-war prosperity is not without its complications. These defense workers are going to be laid off. We just don't need to build guns and tanks and planes to the degree. And so with that decreasing demand in defense industries, you are going to see wages begin to decline for those workers. Um, also, a lot of the controls, I mean, to defeat the Nazis and, and the fascists, we socialized, we, we took over the economy during the war. Remember, price controls meant that things had to be a certain price because the government mandated that. Now, when those price controls ended, we went back to the normal laws of supply and demand. And so many scarce consumer goods went up in price. Um, in fact, Congress wound up reestablishing some of those controls. But all in all, the end of the Second World War saw a remarkable recovery from the Great Depression. You know, more people had money saved up. Um, you know, many of these service workers had money saved up. I mean, if you go into an active combat zone, your income goes up and it's tax free and all of your expenses are paid for because the army feeds you clothes you takes care of you and so many veterans are returning home with a sizable chunk of money saved up 
And so, of course, the effects of this is many of them are going to start families. Uh, but of course, defense spending stays high because of the Cold War uh, and the concern about the Soviet Union. So the first president to oversee America's transition from war to peace was President Harry Truman. It was he who had to decide about the atomic bomb. It's he who's going to have to decide about the Korean War. And he's going to assume this responsibility of making these difficult decisions. A few things he had to deal with. First off, um, the post-war inflation. Remember, with the end of price controls, that means scarce goods are going to go up in price, coupled with lower wages because we don't have 15 million servicemen. We don't have 10 million defense workers anymore. Um, and so there's going to be layoffs. There's going to be economic adjustment. And so, you know, how did Truman deal with that? Well, in some cases, by, you know, for example, with, with mines, uh, with the production of minerals, uh, the government took over many of those mines, those coal mines, those steel mines, those, um, those plants, the means of production. In many cases, the government did take those over. In fact, when workers would go on strike, especially during the war, um, he resolved a lot of those in a very harsh way by simply threatening to draft workers. But now, Truman did not enjoy the same level of pro uh, popularity that Roosevelt had. Um, in fact, during his first term, he lost control of the Senate and the House. Um, and, and as a result, you know, you kind of wind up with the situation that Obama had from 2011 forward, um, where the legislative body and the executive body did not get along, so it became difficult to get anything done. Um, <clears throat> in fact, Congress passed the Taft-Hartley Act, uh, which um, overturned many rights of union workers. Now, Truman was very unique in a lot of ways. And I think while Roosevelt, and really even dating back to Teddy Roosevelt, many of these um, progressive-minded presidents wanted to do something about civil rights. But here, for the first time, Truman had this opportunity, you know, where there was social pressure in support of the civil rights movement. You had one million African Americans fight and returning and demanding equal rights as citizens. And while Congress was still very, um, you know, old-fashioned in the fact that they did not want to recognize the cause of the civil rights movement, Truman was in a unique position. As a wartime president, wartime presidents are extremely powerful. And so he issued executive orders, for example, integrating the armed forces by decree, ending discrimination in government hiring of war-related industries by executive order. These are two huge steps. And it's actually going to begin to identify the Democratic Party with the civil rights movement. You know, and for example, what's the backlash of this? In 1948, many Southern Democrats left the Democratic Party. So many, many Southern Democrats. Remember, that's the base. You know, you've got the Democrats in the South, and, and dating back to the Civil War, the Republicans were a Northern Party. And that changed, that began to change in 1948. Now, in running for election in 1948, um, it was actually a rather close election. You know, Republican Thomas Dewey was slated to win this. Um, and while it was a close political defeat, uh, the Democrats were able to regain control of Congress, though they did lose many southern states. Um, I'm going to guess and say that Mississippi left the Democratic Party. I'm going to guess and say Alabama left the Democratic Party for reasons you can guess. Now, you have to also remember that Truman was FDR's vice president. And so he wanted to, uh, he wanted to create a, a plan uh, an ambitious economic recovery plan, a lot like the New Deal. He called it the Fair Deal. He's going to raise the minimum wage. He's going to create more infrastructure projects and provide low-income housing. 
And then the Korean War happened. And then the Cold War and the growing threat of communism. As well as, you know, Joseph McCarthy, you know, Tr uh, Truman was uh, often painted as being soft on communism. And <clears throat> as his approval ratings began to drop over the Korean War, you know, which was just a, a tragic affair, went on for years and resulted in a stalemate with a very tense situation in North and South Korea. And every president since has tried to fix this situation. You know, but what are you supposed to do? Now, when Dwight D. Eisenhower ran, <clears throat> you know, and, and received the Republican nomination for president of the United States, um, he, he won... And, 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 and really, you know, the Republicans get a resurgence, but I want to give you just a little taste of Dwight D. Eisenhower. He's what we would call um, fiscally conservative and socially liberal. Now, the Republicans really gained in this election uh, from the southern states that left the Democratic Party. And so from Eisenhower forward, you're not going to hear a Republican come out strongly in favor of civil rights. I'm just being honest with you. That's, you know, for example, um, Eisenhower tried to avoid the civil rights movement. But, but really, the reality is this is a popular movement. This is a grassroots thing. It's gaining strength even throughout his presidency. Uh, but he's got to walk carefully because politically, states like Mississippi are watching how he reacts on social civil rights issues. Now, economically, he worked for a balanced budget, uh, but also pushed for a lot of so social legislation, like a federal Department of Health, Department of Education, Department of Welfare. But I want to, in closing, give you a famous quote here from Dwight D. Eisenhower, the famous general of the Second World War. He says, and I quote, Every gun that is made, every warship launched, every rocket fired, signifies in the final sense a theft from those who hunger and are not fed, those who are cold and are not clothed. This world in arms is not spending money alone. It's spending the sweat of its laborers, the genius of its scientists, the hopes of its children. Chapter 27, Section 2. It is called The American Dream in the 50s. So during the 1950s, the economy was at an all-time high. It was booming. And many Americans were receiving the benefit of this. Say a man is made out of mud. A poor man's made out of muscle and blood. Muscle and blood and skin and bone. A mind that's weak and a back that's strong. He loads 16 tons. What do you get? Another day older and deeper in debt. Say, Peter, don't you call me cause I can't go. I owe my soul to the company store. Born one morning when the sun didn't shine Picked up my shovel and I walked to the mine I loaded 16 tons of number nine coal And the star boy said, well, bless 
my soul You load 16 guns Why do you get Another day older and deeper in debt Speed and on your car Because I can't go I'm on my soul To the company store I was born one morning It was drizzling rain Fighting in trouble for my middle name in the cane break by no mama line and a hat on woman made me walk the line you load 16 tons why do you get another day older and deeper in debt so beat it on your call me cause I can't go I'm on my soul to the company store Step aside. A lot of men did, a lot of men died. One fist of iron, the other is steel. If the right one don't get you, then the left one will. You load 16 tons. Why do you get another day older and deeper in debt? So beat it all to come because I can't go. That clip was from Joe versus the volcano, and it's it's based around the premise that Joe, played by Tom Hanks, had this really crappy job that he worked in a low skill environment on an assembly line, making the same mundane products through the same mundane task. Um, in the 1950s, those types of jobs were changing, you know, for a couple of big reasons. Um, more and more Americans were going into higher paying, higher skilled jobs. You know, we, the, we call these white collar, uh, professional positions, working in offices, providing services, uh, lawyers, engineers, you know, doctors, um, and even executives or, or management in a lot of positions because a lot of those low skilled jobs that you might have seen if you watch the rest of that movie are becoming obsolete. They're either being outsourced to other countries or they're being replaced by automation and that process really began in the Second World War moving forward. And so the growing fields in the 1950s were services like sales or advertising. You know one of my favorite shows on Netflix, Mad Men. Um, you know if you like John Hamm it's great. Uh, he works in advertising in the 1950s and 60s but also communications and many of these jobs in the private sector uh, were affiliated with conglomerates um, Google is a conglomerate Apple is a conglomerate uh, both based in the United States but both represent businesses around the world in many unrelated industries I mean, <clears throat> sorry uh, the popular search engine company is doing everything from Helping people, Google, um, you know, silly things to uh, working on advancements in virtual reality. Uh, and the idea there is those companies, even like a tech firm, is very diversified. Uh, so that if virtual reality doesn't take off, which it doesn't seem to be right now, um, then it's very possible uh, that Google can still do fine. They can absorb the losses in one department. Uh, while maintaining a rapidly growing, thriving industry uh, in their other successful ventures. Um, and that's how a conglomerate works. Another type of growing business post-World War II was a franchise. You know, we all work, uh, we all interact with franchises on the regular. I mean, you know, half the time on Wednesdays before I teach my night class I go stop at a franchise any number of fast food places could be Arby's could be Bojangles could be Pizza Hut um, it doesn't matter where I go if I walk into a Pizza Hut I know roughly what to expect 
I even know approximately what type of prices to expect. Fast food restaurants are a thriving version <clears throat> and a really an early version of these franchises. This is when McDonald's got started. Now a lot of these well-paid jobs expect a degree of conformity to go along with them. And while this expectation is changing, uh, you know, for example, a teacher in the 1950s might be expected to wear slacks, button up, tie, maybe even a coat and hat. And I'm thankful that's not the expectation today because I don't know if I would be happy in that. Many people uh, find themselves uh, having to conform to a certain lifestyle to fit in with the company that they work for. Many companies even require potential employees to take personality tests to see if they can thrive in a company culture. Are you a team player? A lot of companies today still ask that question because, you know, if you can't work in a group of people, you're probably not going to thrive in a company environment. You know, maybe you should focus on a more individual career uh, instead of one where you have to face people day to day. And so again, a lot of these high paying jobs are expecting people to behave even in their personal lives a certain way. Little boxes on the hillside, little boxes made of ticky tacky, little boxes on the hillside, little boxes all the same. There's a green one and a pink one and a blue one and a yellow one and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. And the people in the houses all went to the university where they were put in boxes and they came out all the same. And there's doctors and lawyers and business executives and they're all made out of ticky tacky and they all look just the same. Um, the song Little Boxes was written in the 1950s to poke fun at the idea of, of social conformity. Um, but nonetheless, this is the time of the baby boom. You see, in the 1950s, <clears throat> we saw the largest spike in the birth rate in United States history. And thanks to new advancements in medicine, we also saw the lowest infant mortality rates in American history. I mean, it's not, it's not enough that people are just having lots of babies. That's, that's a simplistic explanation of the 1950s. It's that people are having lots of babies, but that lots of babies are surviving. Um, also, more people are moving to the suburbs. Almost all new homes are built. Uh, in suburban communities. Uh, so people are really actually fleeing uh, urban life and going to suburban life. Um, one of the most famous advances in medicine in the 1950s was the cure uh, for poliomyelitis, uh, which we know as polio, uh, cripples young children. Uh, Dr. Jonas Salks developed a vaccine which eliminates your potential to get polio forever. And it was so effective that we have eliminated this disease through vaccine. And um, that's incredible. I mean, some of the only existing samples of polio in the world left are in the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta. Um, so the baby boom has a huge impact on the economy. You know, we have more children than ever. It's going to have a big impact on the education system. We're going to need more services and education. Women's roles also begin to change. Um, popular culture you know, really glorified the mother's role as a homemaker, as a domestic, as a stay-at-home caregiver to her children. But even though that was the ideal often portrayed in pop culture, um, surveys showed that 20% of women hated this life, did not want to be stay-at-home mothers, wanted something else for themselves. And the reality was 
that even though the ideal was the stay-at-home mother, almost half of women were working in some type of field and were also earning less than men for the same jobs. But all in all, life is getting better. The work week was shorter. Paid vacations uh, were luring skilled workers into fields. Labor-saving devices were freeing up time. I mean, uh, you know, the home refrigerator, the oven, the washer and the dryer. Those are incredible time-saving appliances. I mean, can you imagine having to wash your clothes by hand? I've done it. It sucks. And, you know, being able to throw your clothes in a washer and then turn around and throw them in a dryer without having to hang them on a line saves so much time. And what do people do with this time? Well, we see an explosion in recreational activities. You know, of course, my favorite, um, whitewater kayaking came into existence in the 1950s. Mountain biking, if you go to the Smithsonian, you'll see the first mountain bike came into existence in the 1950s, that is riding off-road. Uh, people began doing all manner of things, going hiking, going camping, uh, enjoying weekends, and of course, enjoying spectator sports. Uh, now, meanwhile, this is also when comic book sales began to rise dramatically. Uh, so while you, know, you think about the birth of Captain America was the F Second World War, and really after that, uh, you know, Marvel comic books began to just grow, grow, grow exponentially. And of course, the automobile. Now, while the invention of the automobile goes back several generations, several factors led to the automobile becoming so vital to daily life in the 1950s. Here's a couple cheap gas. Relative to the cost of inflation, gas was cheap. Credit. Interest rates were at all-time lows so that Americans could access an automobile with a low monthly payment. And also, of course, advertising. You know, people were daily exposed to advertising for the latest car, and so conversations between people were often about Hey, did you hear about this new car? Um, and then finally, in the suburbs, you know, if you live, I mean, you know, here's something. If you live in Attawa and you want to commute to school, you're going to need a car. I mean, granted, you could ride a school bus, but if you're coming here to work, you're going to need a car. Uh, I looked it up. It's about an hour, 15-minute bike ride. I may do it as the weather gets nice, but it's not something I'd want to do every day. Um, so an automobile is going to be necessary. But also travel. You know, if you're reading Grapes of Wrath, um, the next chapter in our book, I think it's chapter 16, uh, talks about Route 66. It talks about how they plan to stay on that one interstate highway all the way from Oklahoma to California. That one road is going to take them the entire, I mean, that's the entire book for the most part, is them traveling to get there on that one road. Well, that's Route 66. Paid for, provided through a massive infrastructure spending program signed into law by Republican President Dwight D. Eisenhower. It's called the Interstate Highway Act. Route 66 was just one of them. I mean, you know, get out there and travel. See the country. We live in an incredibly beautiful place. So you've got to see it. And you can see it. And it's, it's not that expensive, thanks to the interstate highway system. And this also enables long-haul trucking. You know, if you spend any time on the interstate, of course, you know that uh, a good chunk, I'd say a third to half the vehicles out there, are long-haul trucks. And, of course, Hendersonville is a thriving community. Why? Well, part of that is because we have easy access to interstate transportation. And so it allows manufacturing and private businesses to thrive. There is a negative side to this mobility. 
Of course, while it stimulates new businesses, everything from the drive-in restaurant to the drive-in movie, um, but it can create a number of social problems. You know, you're more likely to die at your age in an automobile accident than anything else. It is the highest cause of death for young people. Automobiles are dangerous. You know, I for one look forward to the self-driving car at least for increased safety on the highway. Um, it's, it's a really difficult thing, you know. Learning how to drive a car can be a simple process. Learning to drive a car well can take years. And that's, that's the scary thing. And then think about distracted drivers, impaired drivers, uh, any number of conditions uh, that lead to that scary accident rate. But also think about pollution. Um, you know, so many people are driving cars around the world and they're pushing out carbon dioxide fumes that it's had a detrimental effect on our environment. And in places where that has not been taken into account and controls created, um, it actually has an effect on the life expectancy. I mean, if you go to some of the large cities in China, the air is not safe to breathe because of the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And it also creates an economic gulf. You know, the, the poor tend to locate within cities uh, because that's where the low-income housing is. And, and the wealthier tend to flee the cities and move to the suburbs. You know, in my case, I've just been able to afford that lifestyle. I mean, it, it's taken me a long time to get there. Um, and so, you know, there's that economic gulf. Uh, and, and that's a gap, really, is that many people don't have access uh, to that quality of life. But also new products. With more Americans than ever in the middle class, in fact twice as many as before the Second World War, um, we see this culture of consumerism. That is the culture of buying material goods as equated with success. Um, Excuse me, a uh, really good book. I've got it over here if you want to borrow it. Babbitt uh, was written at the time. It was a work of satire poking fun um, at the materialist, the person obsessed with having the new things. Um, and of course, you know, that being the culture, numerous products appear in response to this demand. Uh, you know, think about it this way I got my first smartphone in 2016, I was way behind the game. And I did tons of research, I obsessed, and I bought a really nice one. And what did I do? Two years later, I tore it up. Uh, drowned it in the river, didn't mean to, life happens. Okay, so I had bought the warranty. I had like went way above and beyond, had the warranty, they sent me a new one. What did I do? I tore it up a month ago. You know, I know, I'm an idiot. Uh, well, okay, lesson learned. This time, I bought the cheapest one I could find. And it works! It does calls, it does text, it does GPS, it does email, it does everything that I need it to, and it's waterproof. Whoa, you know, who was I to know that I didn't need to spend caboodles of money on a phone? Now granted, if that's something you have a high value for, do it. You know, it's a relative, it's, it's called uh, marginal utility is the economic term for that. If the nicest phone has a high marginal utility for you. That means that's something you, you're into. You read about them, you know how to use it, you're gonna max out its potential, and to you, that is worth it. But after drowning two expensive phones, I learned that's not what I use them for. So um, again, what I've learned is that I have a lower marginal utility, but that's a relative thing. So again, it depends on what you're looking for. And then finally, planned obsolescence. Because another hard lesson I had to learn about smartphones is the one that did manage to last two years, the battery was beginning to wear out. And I was like, are you kidding me? I just spent how much money on a phone and the battery's beginning to decline after two years? Um, you know, my goal was to make it last four years, but now I think I understand that just wouldn't have been realistic. You see, Phones are designed to wear out in a particular set point of time. And, and what does that make us want to do? Buy a new one. 
Okay, so I bought a cheap one. Well, guess what? In two years, the cheap one then will be the expensive one now. And they'll both make calls and text and do all the things. Uh, and maybe even more of the things. You never know. But that's the idea is that a thing is designed to wear out in a certain point in time. Now, the easy availability of credit. I mean, we all do this, right? You know, most people can't pay cash for a house. You know, of course, we didn't either. Most people can't pay cash for a car. Hey, you know, you get those things on credit. Um, and, and with this, you acquire personal debt. You know, now this is something I really want to caution you about as a young person, is think very carefully before you get a credit card. Because credit companies will prey particularly on the young people. And they can get you hooked early. Because it feels so nice to have the thing you want now. But again, be very careful about that. Because of course this is the advertising age. More people have satisfied their basic needs. Okay, so you don't have to advertise bread or milk or coffee. I mean, you do, but those are necessities. So what are you going to advertise? Cars, phones, you know, things you could live without, luxuries. Um, and, and we are inundated with advertising. Okay, guys, so today we'll be talking about Chapter 27, Section 3, and it's called uh, the Popular Culture in the 1950s. We'll be talking about, you know, what mainstream Americans um, watched and listened to and enjoyed and read. And we'll also be talking about the counterculture, that is kind of the, the emerging hippie movement. We'll talk about beatniks and Jack Kerouac, and you might finally begin to understand that sign in the back of the room there. Uh, but these new forms of entertainment in the 1950s. So first off, television. Television was the mass media, that is, means of communication that can reach large audiences of the 1950s. I, I mean, this is obviously before smartphones. Uh, radio was already popular at the time, uh, but TV was first widely available in 1948, and it was in almost all homes within a decade. I, I mean, it was how people got their news, it was how they got their entertainment, Everybody watched the same shows because there were basically three channels on, and they were also uh, deeply regulated. The Federal Communications Commission, the FCC, uh, regulates communications on mass airways. Um, by 1956, there were only 500 stations nationwide um, that had rights to broadcast through the FCC, and, and mainly they were broadcasting the uh, the main syndicated networks of ABC, CMB, ABC, NBC, and CBS. Uh, and there, so again, you know, a lot of the programming are things that everyone is watching. You know, did you see the Ed Sullivan show? Of course I did. What else was on? You know, did you watch Din Dick Van Dyke? I mean, are you kidding? It was eight o'clock. What else were we doing? You know, yes, everybody watched the same thing once upon a time. Um, and so what were they watching? Well, you know, you've got your primetime TV from 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Within this time, you've got comedies, you've got news at 6, you've got dramas, uh, you've got variety shows. You know, like think about SNL as kind of the modern variety show. And you also have children's programming. Um, you know, there's, there's daytime TV with soap operas and children's shows. Uh, and there's even a TV guide publication comes in your house mail every week. Uh, and there's even TV dinners. So, so there was an entire industry built to market to this incredible medium that everybody was obsessed with. Who knows best? What? 
out in the driveway, something I bought for Bud, something he's always wanted. Well, it probably means something you want and never been able to have. Good heavens. How do you like it? Happy! Good heavens! Oh, good heavens! I told you not to touch things. Is she all right? Yeah, a little oily, but otherwise sound. Kathy, go upstairs and put on a clean dress. I just put this one on. It's kind of set with the dirt. Go on with you. Gosh, Father, where did you get this? That's exactly what I'd like to know. I bought it secondhand. But, darling, we've got a perfectly good car. Why, why you look ridiculous riding around a thing like that. It's not for me. It's for Bud. Now, quick, Jim, hide that thing. Bud will be back any minute. Hide it where? Well, right in the garage and, and throw something over it. Throw what over? Oh, Jim, you're stalling just so he can see it. Now, hurry up. Poor Bud. He and I could have had a lot of fun with this thing. My motor scooter. Oh, be careful. And don't speak. Look out for the truck. Don't worry. Think I'll ever get a chance to ride it? Why, of course, son. It's yours. <laughs> So, I want to point out a few stereotypes from this show. Uh, first off, uh, the women portrayed in the show were absolutely stereotypes. I mean, this is cookie cutter, right? You've got your wife, mother, as a domestic caregiver, full-time mother. Um, you know, your perfectly behaved children. You know, the worst instance of misbehavior behavior you saw was the little girl grabbing the motorcycle. And, you know, it's just kind of like happy... Um, blasé, stereotypical, glorified family. Here's a few things you didn't see. I didn't see a minority. Um, I didn't see an African American. I didn't see a Latino at all in the show. Um, maybe throughout the entire history of the show, uh, maybe there were a few. I, I, again, that's just not something you would commonly see portrayed in television shows of the 1950s. Um, you know, westerns were popular. Uh, Gunsmoke, Howdy Doody, um, you know, portrayed historical frontier conflicts in, in a very sanitized way. Um, and of course, I guess some of the next things that we'll look at uh, did raise concerns about the effect of violence in children. So, television did cut into radio and movie markets. Um, you know, radio remained relevant, uh, especially for automobiles, uh, and, and while uh, they invested less uh, in nighttime programming, um, they turned their efforts toward local news, weather, uh, especially music, uh, and then local affairs. Uh, many stations specialize in different types of music to market to particular groups. Um, and, and, of course, at this time, movies uh, began to incorporate color um, and, and even to uh, capitalize on gimmicks like Invasion of the Body Snatchers that we watched earlier um, and, and, and to try many different advantages. So here's a few more examples for us. Line them up. Hey, look at 
go all the way up to the end and get your cars and bring them up on the right hand side. Take your car and put them on the left hand side. Hurry up, turn your lights and turn the center. Hurry up, get going. Come on, let's light them up. Goose, come here. Huh? Get those guys straighten that up there. Tell them when to turn on their lights. Johnny, follow that top road stroke. Okay. You okay? Yeah, give me some dirt. Hey, Toreador. She signals. We head for the edge. And the first man who jumps is a chicken. All right? Me too. Mm -hmm. Uh, may I have some dirt, please? <laughs> So I wanted to list off a few popular TV shows at the time. I Love Lucy was one that I mean I'm sure you guys have all heard of. It's it's remained fun and relevant and popular, and you can still find the reruns in a number of different places. Uh, See it now and Playhouse 90 were also uh, highly syndicated, highly uh, subscribed to shows. Uh, but if you take these three shows and you begin to study them using these three terms: poverty, diversity, and racial discrimination. You won't find them. These are just subjects that were generally avoided um, in, in popular television programming. Uh, <clears throat> for one, the FCC closely regulated all television program communications. I mean, so much so that, you know, if, if profanity were used, um, it would be edited out, um, you know, or that director could be blacklisted. I mean, you just, you just don't uh, mess with the FCC. Uh, they approve what can go on the airways and what cannot, and again, they particularly wanted to avoid these subjects. So, for example, in Leave it to Beaver, you just saw, again, the mother as the domestic, the caregiver, the server, um, the father as the provider, um, you know, the child as happy and supported and, you know, just... Uh, the comic relief, if you will. But there was a counterculture, too, meaning not everyone felt this way. And, you know, an increasing number of people identified as nonconformist. Uh, you know, many of these are writers and artists that, you know, were leading the avant-garde in this direction. Um, <clears throat> and, and they would gather 
um, in coffee shops or in book houses um, and, and, and discuss issues uh, and recite poetry. And, and you could even argue that the rhythm of the spoken word uh, was a, a literary art form used, you know, beat poetry. Uh, that is the spoken word accompanied by light jazz. Um, and these beatnik attitudes, uh, you know, probably one of the most well-known books from a beatnik author is On the Road by Jack Kerouac. And, uh, you know, one of my favorite passages from the book is where he says, you know, it's on the back of the wall there, that the only people for me are the mad ones. The ones mad to live, mad to talk, desirous of everything at the same time. They never yawn or say a commonplace thing, but they explode like spiders into the stars. And yes, it's artistic. You know, yes, it's not meant, it's, 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 you, you just got to think about it for a while. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, he wrote that book on the road while hitchhiking across the country. Um, and yes, there's drug influence in his writings. Um, you know, yes, these are the early hippies. Uh, but I just, I always like, you know, pointing to the counterculture. And so I've got an excerpt of On the Road to play for you guys, re read by Jack Kerouac in the style of beat poetry. Um, so also, you know, fun fact about this, another famous beatnik, Allen Ginsberg, uh, was one of the first openly homosexual celebrities uh, at a time where this would have been, you know, a really difficult thing to, to come out about. Anyway, I wrote the book because we're all going to die. In the loneliness of my life, my father dead, my brother dead, my mother far away, my sister and my wife far away. Nothing here but my own tragic hands that once were guarded by a world, a sweet attention that now are left to guide and disappear their own way into the common dark of all our deaths. Sleeping in me raw bed alone and stupid, with just this one pride and consolation, my heart broke in a general despair and opened up inwards to the Lord. I made a supplication in this dream. So in the last page of On the Road, I describe how the hero, Dean Moriarty's come to see me all the way from the West Coast just for a day or two. We've just been back and forth across the country several times in cars and now our adventures are over. We're still great friends, but we have to go into later phases of our lives. So there he goes, Dean Moriarty, ragged in the moth-eaten overcoat he brought specially for the freezing temperatures of the East. Walking off alone, and last I saw him, he rounded the corner of 7th Avenue, eyes on the street ahead, and bent to it again. Gone. So, in America, when the sun goes down, and I sit on the old broken down river pier watching the long, long skies over New Jersey and sense all that raw land that rolls in one unbelievable huge bulge over to the west coast and all that road going and all the people dreaming in the immensity of it and now I know by now that children must be crying in the land where they let the children cry and tonight the stars will be out and don't you know that God is Pooh Bear? The evening star must be drooping and shedding her sparkler dims on the prairie, which is just before the coming of complete night that blesses the earth, darkens all the rivers, cups the peaks, and folds the final shore in. Nobody, nobody knows what's going to happen to anybody besides the forlorn rags of growing old. Think of Dean Moriarty, I even think of old Dean Moriarty, the father we never found. Think of Dean Moriarty. I think of Dean Moriarty. So I never said beat poetry was easy to understand, but it does reward the diligence. So uh, it's worth a second listen or even a read. I've got the book on the road if any of you want to borrow it. Um, so now... Let's have some fun and listen to rock and roll. Rock and roll, a uh, mixture of the rhythm and blues, of country and pop, you all know about it, uh, has a lot first to be thankful for uh, from African American music. I mean, jazz and the blues are 
some of the biggest influences um, on this musical phenom. Uh, so a few characteristics before I'll let it describe itself. Uh, heavy rhythm, simple melodies, you know, whereas you just listen to some beat poetry that could take some time to unpack. When you listen to Elvis Presley, you're, you'll have no trouble figuring out what the heck he's talking about. You know, it's, it's designed to appeal to young people. It's designed to sell records. Jack Kerouac made you want to think and talk in depth in coffee shops about whatever the heck he was trying to say. Elvis Presley wanted to make money. Um, and of course, who's the more famous? Well, yes, I mean, he was heavily marketed. Now, I think it's ironic that when we listen to Elvis Presley, you're going to go, yeah, that's like an oldies, a classic. Huh? You know, that's what my grandparents listened to, I think. Um, okay, yeah, okay. But I want you to also understand this was avant-garde avant in the way that adults were concerned about the morality of these performers and the influence they were having on young people. So here we go. If I remember correctly, we'll start with Elvis Presley. I had a kind of a vacation with a bunch of men in a big place away out yonder, and while I was there, well, these uh, these men, kind of guests, you might say, uh, well, we'd get together and horse around a little bit and sing, and because we were having such a good time, and uh, well, we always had a lot of fun with this one, the Jailhouse Rock. I want to play for you is um, one of the most famous African American rock and roll performers of the 1950s, Chuck Berry. And I, I just I want want to remind you that you know rock and roll emerged from African American music, which was already hot and selling. 
And even though it was mostly white audiences that African Americans were performing for, uh, in, in many cases, I think it's bridging the racial gap. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, many of these shows are broadcast on primarily uh, black radio stations, uh, you know, targeting black audiences. Uh, but many of these performers are selling and popular among white audiences as well. Um. Shout Factory TV, changing the channel. Chuck Berry. <laughs> Thank you. 
you're here. Glad you're here. Hope you had a nice week. We had a wonderful week, and I think we've got a, a whale of a show for you tonight. Chapter 27, Section 4. It's called The Other America. And so amidst the prosperity of the 1950s, we have to remember that the, the Great Depression did not end for everyone. Millions of Americans were still living in poverty. You know, one example I want to give you is white flight. Uh, the difference between suburban life and urban life. By 1962, the poverty level was down. So think about this. Prior to the stock market crash, we were at about 70% poverty level. By 62, that number had dropped to 25%. But that's still a huge number. 20, one out of four Americans in 1962 could not afford the basic necessities for a comfortable life for their families. Um, and, and this was affecting minorities to a higher degree uh, than it was white Americans. And so that's the term white flight, that many prosperous Americans were leaving the cities um, and, and many of the low income neighborhoods were uh, in, in, in the inner city. And so what does this mean? So this means that the inner cities um, have, have very low tax revenue very low social services, very little money for their schools, uh, for their, their public facilities. Um, and so, you know, many cities can't afford to keep schools open. 
They can't afford to provide public transportation and much less police or fire. And so poverty in the inner cities begins to grow rapidly. And these poor economic conditions lead to illness, often due to malnutrition or terrible living conditions because of the inability to fix this. Now, um, a lot of cities post-World War II to the present have been engaged in urban renewal projects, that is, replacing run-down buildings uh, with new federally subsidized low-income housing. Uh, you know, with the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, this department was created to improve conditions in inner cities, uh, to provide funding for low-income housing. Even Hendersonville has uh, federally subsidized low-income housing through the Housing and Urban Development Department. But here's the problem with that. There's not enough. There's not enough. And so maybe you qualify for that if your family's below a certain income level. Maybe there's room, maybe there's not. Maybe your family makes too much to qualify for low-income housing, but not enough to actually pay for housing yourself. You fall into that gap. And so there's just not enough to go around. And like I said, many of these things are affecting minorities to a higher degree. Um, so in the Southwest, states like Arizona, New Mexico, and, uh, and even Texas and California, uh, many of the people living in these places um, are first or second generation immigrants from Mexico. And uh, throughout the years of the war, there was a program called the Bracero Program, uh, which was encouraging migration of Latinos to the United States uh, to develop the Southwest, to populate the Southwest, to work. Um, and, and the program was set to expire in 1947, meaning that these people were invited to the United States to work, to live, to develop these industries and cities and towns. But then they were expected to leave after five years. And so you're telling me that the people who are coming here to start over and, and to begin families and to work and develop careers are now called illegal aliens. So invited when we needed them and then we were expected to kick people to the curb. There was an incident called the Longoria incident uh, where um, a Latino veteran of the Second World War, Felix Longoria, um, had passed away. And the funeral home in his town refused uh, to serve this man, uh, refused to provide services. Um, in fact, uh, it, it led to uh, a, a union of Mexican-American veterans. Remember, 300,000 Mexican-Americans fought in the Second World War. And then going back to a country that, in some cases, refused to uh, bury their dead, in some cases, expected them to leave. To, okay, go fight for the war. And then leave? Are you kidding me? Um, and, and so they organized and began the Unity League of California, beginning a, a voter registration drive, um, <coughs> excuse me, to register Latino voters. Um, and you know what? That program began in the 1950s. And by 2012, the Latino vote influenced a presidential election for the first time. That's how long it can take to actually see political action come to fruition works. In a democracy, political action works, but it can take a very long time. I don't know if you know this, but Native Americans are among the poorest people in the United States. Um, the U.S. policy toward Native Americans during the Great Depression was in favor of autonomy, mainly because we didn't want to have to provide public services for Native American communities. Um, from the Great Depression forward, the United States has implemented a termination policy, which means to cut off economic support um, to Native American communities. You know, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Affairs was focused mainly on urbanization, on taking Native Americans off of their reservations and relocating them in cities. It proved to be a colossal failure. You know, so here we have a social experiment. What happens if we take the poorest, most vulnerable people and say, bootstraps, 
You got this. Pull yourself up. What happens? You ever wondered? Hey, gee, I wonder what happens if we make these people do what they can on their own. Um, it's, it's a colossal failure. You can't take a group of people that have been historically marginalized, that have been discriminated against and abused and looked down upon, and then say, cool, you're ready for the world. Good luck. Uh, it, the program was abandoned in, in 63.